it's all kind of penny ante uh, stuff as opposed to the great and glorious dreams for a separate Quebec. The U.S. is not now a society of just laws, and Canada should not have an extradition treaty with it. Doctors, bells are piling sky high. Ronnie, uh, we've known each other a great many years, including some horrifyingly liquefied evenings that would not have extended <laughs> our, uh, our life expectancy. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Conrad Black and Denise Donlan. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to edition one of The Zoomer. Thank you for tuning in and showing up. To my right, historian, writer, financier, and my co-host, Conrad Black. Welcome, everybody. Conrad, who are we going to see tonight? Brian Mulroney. Oh. And despite his long love affair with the press, he doesn't give interviews very often. And this wasn't really, as you know, an interview. It was a conversation. But mm -hmm. he, he's really quite direct and I think quite revealing on several current issues. Today around the round table, we're going to talk radical longevity. But before we do, here's a few stories we've been following this week. A United Nations study is reporting that Canada ranks fifth out of 91 countries in the social and economic well-being of their elders. Sweden was on the top and Afghanistan was on the bottom. The report came with a warning that countries are not coping with their aging populations. And this isn't a, a, back, a back burner issue anymore because by 2050, for the first time in history, people over 60 across the planet will outnumber children younger than 15. The park was front and center with ceremonial flag raisings across the country to help pay tribute to our seniors who have built our country and who continue to make valuable contributions to Canada. New rules from Health Canada for what they call a free market approach to licensing large indoor medical marijuana farms. The government expects revenues for the new industry to reach $1.3 billion a year by 2024. The controversial plan prohibits patients from growing their own so that Health Canada can ensure the quality of the product. <laughs> now the question is, even though Stephen Harper has stated that he has never smoked pot and he has no intention of decriminalizing marijuana, what's with the new rules? Is he just trying to smoke out Justin Trudeau? Let's zoom out and find out. What do you think, Conrad? Is this political maneuvering? Uh, it's not for me to impute motives to him, but I don't think he thinks he's got a lot of votes among the pot users. Oh, he doesn't. So he's not losing. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, he's got a lot of votes among the among the seniors, I, uh, from what we understand. He actually yeah. has the boomer zoomer is actually his best bet to actually get legalized marijuana. So I'm not sure if this, um, you know, selling it himself is a, is somewhat a sop to that generation because when we polled our members. 60% supported legalizing pot, not just decriminalizing it, and certainly not just having police issue tickets. And so there's an entire generation that, well, grew up on it and <laughs> see no reason why it shouldn't be legalized. It's a, Susan, are you saying he's going to lose votes with his stance? He might actually uh, win some votes if he's going to be Canada's biggest drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to vote for him, I'll tell you that. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Ronnie. <laughs> My point exactly. There you go. They're Stay with us. We're going to be back in a second with our guide to living to 120. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. I'm here about a new mortgage. Oh, do you have any collateral? Why, yes. <laughs> Mr. Harper defeated Mr. Martin. Stefan Dio and Michael Ignatieff. Justin Trudeau is no Stefan Dio. A healthy 60 year old has a 50% chance of living to 90. How about a healthy 6 year old? 125. Seriously? Welcome back to the Zoomer. Today we're talking radical longevity. Let's get some background on the subject so we're all on the same page. Take a look at this. In 
1513, the Spanish conquistador Ponce de Leon was searching for the fountain of youth when he bumped into what is now Florida. He did not find the fountain of youth. Maldito. In 1513, life expectancy was about 36 years. In 1900, it rose to 50. In the 1950s, it rose again to 63. Now, life expectancy is between 80 and 83. And it gets better. A baby born today has a good chance of living until they're 120. <laughs> Canadians now live three more years than Americans. Three more years free health care, eh? Go Leafs! British Columbians live longer than anyone else in Canada, proving that Nanaimo bars are more healthy than originally thought. <laughs> Women tend to live longer than men, but the men are catching up. As Leonard Cohen sings... She's a hunger, but she's wearing something tight. Sounds good, but is there enough money to support pension, old age security, and health care? There better be, because here comes the silver tsunami. So let's start with a question I know all of you are asking. Could this really happen? And if so, would I really want it to? Dr. Michael Fossil has authored many books on the subject, including Reversing Human Aging and a definitive textbook on the subject, Cells, Aging, and Human Disease. And so, Michael, I want to start with you. Is this 120-year projection just a headline? I think it is. Really? I do. Uh, you know, I think that you can't get to 120. You certainly can't get beyond it unless we do something dramatically different. And you raise that immediate question, why would you want to? If it's another 20 years in a nursing home, not me, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. No, it's not only going to have to be something we do dramatically different, but it has to mean a better life, too. I'm going to go to you, Adam, because your book, it's the book of immortality, which sounds almost biblical when you think about it. Um, and it took you all over the world to meet people who have dedicated their lives to living forever, which has been really an age-old quest, right, full of wild practices. What I found is that since the earliest examples of uh, medical history that we have tried to find methods of either prolonging life or trying to live forever. And of course, none of them have ever worked. And there are some, there are some quite ridiculous examples of like? Chinese emperors who, who took mercury-based potions of immortal life mm. and they died as a result of consuming these potions. <laughs> and all sorts of other things. I mean, there's just this kind of un unceasing litany of things that we have done that have never worked. And to this day, we still don't know how to prolong human lifespans. We're living longer than ever before, but we don't know how to slow the aging process or how to reverse it or even how to affect it. Libby, you've run into all kinds of people who are trying hard to extend their lives, like the caloric reduction people, right? Those, well, those I guys? Think, well, if you don't live to 120, it'll certainly feel like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> not for me, thank you. Well, it's interesting that it turns out that a lot of people might actually not want to live longer. And uh, Susan, you did a recent carpool which talked about this. Let's take a look at that. Canadians were asked if we wanted to live to be 120 years old. 56% of us said, mm, no thanks, and 19% said, yes please. If not, why not? 76% said it will strain resources, and 54% said it was fundamentally unnatural. And what are our greatest concerns about longevity? 52% say staying healthy, and 11% worry about having enough money. All in all, though, while we expect to live to 88, CARP members are gunning for 94. Jonathan Swift referred to the Streldbrugs, the old people where limbs Dictionary. were falling off and they were just, uh, you know, they, 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 they were decrepit. And with great respect, Susan, it's a, we all know about polls on all subjects. It's sort of a matter of how they're, how they're worded. I mean, most people would, most people are afraid of actually dying. They're not afraid of being dead particularly, but they do, the actual process of dying frightens everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they would rather defer it seen a DA if their health is all right. So Dr. Donald Lowe's legacy as a leader uh, is really in the field of medicine. But what he did in the eight days before his death uh, really showed true grit. He recorded a video, and it was a really personal plea for doctor-assisted suicide in the country. I was diagnosed as having a brainstem tumor February 7th, 2013. Uh, there's a lot of opposition to it. A lot of clinicians oppos have opposition to dying with dignity. I wish they could live in my body for 24 hours, and I think they would change that 
change that opinion. I'm just frustrated not being able to have control of my own life, not being able to make the decision for myself when enough is enough. You know, we've come far enough. It's time to, to bring it to an end. And I really envy countries like Switzerland and the Netherlands and the United States where this is possible. I mean, why, why make people suffer for no reason when there's an alternative? I'm going to start with you right away, Susan, because what do you think? Are we ever going to get to a place where Canada is all right with dying with dignity? I think that we are starting to get a lot of uh, interest in it, and I think we have to start the conversation. We are so afraid of talking about it right now that actually I can't tell you what we think. And I think that when we look at this kind of thing, we actually were uh, graded by the economists who were looking at a quality, quality of death index, mm -hmm. and they graded Canada very poorly. They said, on one hand, you do have universal health care. On the other hand, you won't talk about it. So we can't have a useful decision about what kind of quality of death do we have in the country? What can we do for people? What kind of rights do they have to choose their time and manner of death? I am perhaps unrepresentative. I'm something of a stick in the mud, and I have some concerns about trivializing the whole idea of people dying, whether it's abortions, the death penalty, or uh, you know, unrestrained police actions, or even this. But I, I, we've got to watch any legislation about this. If people want to commit suicide, they can do it until they've reached an absolutely extreme position. But um, if we get too casual about life being just dispensable, it is going to lead to bad things. I mean, the questions really revolve around people's religion. They fear that they're going to be pushed <laughs> over. Mm -hmm. um, they fear that people who are elderly or ill are going to be pressured. Uh, and of course, there's the objection that you know they don't really actually want to talk about it at all. They just think life should take its natural course. But as Dr. Lowe said, until they see what death looks like, you know, at those last moments, it's not like it's on TV where you just say goodbye and lie down. It is actually pretty ugly. I mean, I know there are times when I have quietly unplugged a ventilator. Um, it's not done officially. It's done when the family and the nurses and everybody feels it to be done but it's a very private sort of decision. On the other hand, it's easy for a lot of us to have an intellectual opinion about this, but I got faced with the other side of it when it was my mother. She was 75, she was terminal, and she asked if I could help. And I said, listen, I can tell you how to do it, but for some reason I can't explain it. I cannot help do it. I cannot go and buy it for you, I can just, but I can't do it. And I don't know whether it's because I'm a physician or because you're my mother, but it became very different for me that moment. Ronnie, you were facing a radical terminal cancer. They gave me 90 days or less to they get, live. They, and so what happened? You're still here looking I pretty good. I started partying. I did things that killed Charles Atlas. <laughs> <laughs> but then you met, you were healed over the phone, I understand. This kid, Adam, mm -hmm. I was telling you about earlier. We just I, Not he, this kid. Uh, Adam, his, dream healer. His dad, him, called me. His dad was a fan, evidently. And he was about 15 years old then, a very young kid super smart and so when they called me they said that he, they thought that that could, they could heal me you know so when you're dying you'll try anything mm -hmm. goodness I said well come on <laughs> let's try her and he came out there and did a little stuff but uh, we don't know whether it was him or the, all those other good doctors or all that medicine I was on but anyway I went in the last time to take what do you call them a cat scan or whatever they call that is mm -hmm. and they stood there and looked at one another it was gone like a July snow my simple country boy way of thinking is uh, if, you, if you're going and there ain't nothing nobody can do about it, get it over with as quick as you can because you, so many of your family's suffering, everybody's suffering, everything, and the bills are going up. When it's time for me to go, I know how I'm going to go. Well, I'm glad you're taking advantage of all the extra years you've got because you sound like a total Uber Zoomer to me. We're going to be right back after this. Welcome back to 
the Zoomer. We're talking radical longevity today. And Conrad, I remember, and maybe she still does it, the Queen used to send a personal greeting to all of her subjects when they turned 100. That's got to be a full-time job now. Well, she sent 255 in her first year as Queen in 1952, and, and in the UK and the Commonwealth countries, you know, the then dominions. Mm. And now it's up to almost 7,000. A year? Yes. Wow. And uh, in the United States, the president sends a letter. Mm -hmm. And in Ireland, the president sends a letter accompanied by a check for two and a half thousand euros. Irish. Uh, it's good to be Irish. But you know, the queen, in another 12 and a half years, she'll be writing a letter to herself. <laughs> I, I want to make one comment. I think Ronnie Hawkins is clearly the subject of a miracle. And you're halfway to sainthood, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> And this is a momentous development that's been under-recognized, I think, in popular culture in this country. Mm -hmm. Libby, you recently went out to a nursing home where there was a dozen or so centenarians celebrating. Even more. It was the mother of all birthday parties. Fourteen people at St. Hilda's Retirement and Assisted Living were marking these big milestones. That's nearly 10% of the nursing home's population. Even more remarkable, the two oldest women seem to be in the best shape. So I spent a little time with them to try to learn something about what it takes. Happy birthday to you. Happy You're 102. Yes. Lucky. What do you think of that? That I think I'm blessed happy because I'm here, I have no, I have peace, I have a very loving, wonderful family who encouraged me to try to do everything in order to stay alive. What's your secret to living so long? To have a very positive attitude. And what do you enjoy doing? I attend yoga, tai chi, fitness classes that they offer and apart from that I sit at home and I reflect on my past. So you are going to be 105? Yeah. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? Uh, well, yeah, I just live with it. <laughs> <laughs> but you seem to be in great shape. You, uh... Yeah, I'm not, a, not too bad. I have my aches and pains like everybody else. I guess I just inherited a long life, that's all. What do you think? <laughs> that's my daughter. Oh, how old is she? Oh, 78, I think. <laughs> she, she looks very young, my goodness. Really? <laughs> Carol. Your mother just told me you're 78. Is that true? No. <laughs> no. No, 75, actually. What do you think the secret is? Your mother is about to turn 105. You're 75. Well, she's been active all her life. She was square dancing into her 90s and lawn bowling into her 90s and playing bridge. She's a life master, a life master bridge player. Would you like to live to 120? No. I don't like living this long. I'd sooner pass along earlier. Why? <clears throat> well, what's, I, my husband died and uh, I was very lonely and uh, I miss him very, very much. So um, I don't feel that I have that much to live for. She feels she's a burden because uh, she can't do things for herself. She can't drive anymore, and she can't, she can't get drive anymore. She's 105. Well, she she has appointments, doctor's appointments, and she really hates to put anybody out to drive her to her appointments. So she feels she's a burden. Would you like to live to 120? No. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Another year, maybe. You know. I think that in addition to lengthening our telomeres and replacing our worn out parts, the longevity scientists are going to have to figure out how to reinvigorate the appetite mm -hmm. for life. What do you think, Susan? We got in our poll, in addition to talking about their health, a lot of people worried about whether or not they would outlive all their family and their friends. Mm -hmm. So people are very 
uh, level-headed when they talk about the issue of longevity, that life not the quantity of life, but the quality of life is what matters. So what can we do? As Libby says, there are things that we could do very easily. She didn't want to be lonely. Well, we can, we can fix that. These are things we can fix. There are scientific things. Medical science may not be able to fix some of these things, but we can fix social change. I, and that's where politics does work in our favor. These are things that we can actually ask for. It's interesting that, that um, when we talk about trying to live to 120, we think oh, that's something that would be desirable. But, but again, as these people we saw, they, they said they don't want to. They don't want to live to beyond uh, 101, 102. And why is that? And even when we talk about these potential treatments that could be out there, People don't want to take them if they were made available. And why is that? It's because we're dubious about whether these things can actually help us. Mm. These, yeah. these two women that I spent time with, their health was fine. And the things that they said, she thought she was a burden because she couldn't drive, excuse me. Mm -hmm. The other woman said, you know. Just them of that. Yeah, no, the other woman said, um, I don't hear well. So I used to have very close relationships, friendships in this. And I used to talk. And we can't talk anymore. I'm thinking, hearing aid? Uh, mm -hmm. how, how hard is that? Mm -hmm. But I think it's something else that's maybe a little more yeah, profound. Yeah, no, I mean, when Benjamin Disraeli lost his hearing, it extended his life as prime minister. He said, <laughs> I don't have to listen to all these ghastly politics. <laughs> 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 but I think the point that you're making that, you know, that these are easily remedied. There's this precept that at a certain age, you're no more use. Mm. You can only be defined by your def dependency. And if we don't change that attitude, then people are going to self-identify with that. Mm. And they're going to start saying, well, you know, maybe I should call it quits. And unless we can fix that, unless we can actually push back when we hear even the language of gray tsunami, mm -hmm. um, we're going to see that more and more people will be unhappy as they last longer. Mm. Maybe we can change that. That's an easier thing to well, do. Well, I think I have a, a way to want to uh, go out well, and that's to keep on rocking. So we're going to come back and talk to Ronnie after the break. And in the meantime, I'm going to leave you with, with this revelation just to set the record straight. Ronnie Hawkins invented the moonwalk in 1959. Everyone. more people like Ronnie Hawkins, we'd do less stupid things to each other, we'd hurt fewer people, we'd have a lot more laughs. I mean, he's just, uh, I never met another one like him. To the town. Little Willie, oh, he's a menace. To the town. Oh, the women love him because he's always messing around. Mess around, Willie boy. Oh, that's a handsome bugger. Right, he's a handsome bugger. You're absolutely right, Ronnie. Ronnie, uh, we've known each other a great many years, including some horrifyingly liquefied evenings that would not have extended <laughs> our. Uh, our life expectancies. Did you ever think you'd be going out on the road again at 78? Well, I, I, I was hoping I could, because there's still a few girls out there that I hadn't seen yet. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I went by to see a couple of my old girlfriends in Kitchener, you know, a couple of months ago. They've been dead five or six years, man. I didn't even know it. Man. Oh. So you know I'm getting a little old. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I got to have that body transplant. Well, Ronnie, thank you so much for stopping by. This is the state of the Canadian music industry. Ronnie, Ronnie's got to go. He's got a gig. So thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you baby. very much. Thank you. Thank you. And see how this is the smartest man in the world. I've been told that <laughs> for 50 years. <laughs> Not by me. <laughs> <laughs> so as Ronnie Broadway. heads out, I'm going to go over because Molly Johnson has walked in. <laughs> I'm 
made a promise to myself that I would sooner rot in hell than spend another moment with you. I feel the time is slipping by And if I felt it was worth a try Then maybe, baby, I would try just one more sad side I have sipped the sweetest wine but this one tastes just past its prime. So go on, take the long wave goodbye. Doctor's bills are piling sky high while I try to reason with why I haven't taken the long wave goodbye. To tell your baby to hit that road But one look at you with those sad brown eyes Well, I hate to see a grown man cry You gotta go on, pack your things Cause I'm cutting all your strings And I'm waving the long That would be your last mistake. Hill of beans don't count for much. Forget to write, please don't keep in touch. Cause I'm waving the long. Mr. Harper defeated Mr. Martin, Stefan Dio, and Michael Ignatieff. Justin Trudeau is no Stefan Dio. Conversation with Brian Mulrooney. Conrad, how'd it go? Oh, very well. I've known him even longer than I've known Ronnie Hawkins, and of course, he's a great Irish raconteur, and he says some interesting things here. Well, Brian, pardon my uh, informality, but we've known each other nearly 50 years, and it would be a bit contrived if we weren't on a first name basis at this point. Thank you for joining us. It is an honor to have you as the first subject of one of these conversations in this new program of ours. I'm delighted to be with you on behalf of whole crew, thanks very much. May I start, since it's quite topical, by asking you as somebody who went through the wars of the, uh, as many consider them to be authoritarian laws in Quebec about treatment of minorities, what do you think of the uh, controversy over the Charter of Values in that province? Well, I think it was a needless controversy. No one uh, needed this. The protections that you could legitimately look for in a democratic society or need uh, are all there, have been there since 1975, uh, provincially and federally since 1982 with the Charter. Uh, and so if you want to build a dynamic, inclusive society, you've got all the instruments at hand. This uh, limits uh, that and sends out what I consider to be a, uh, a negative, inappropriate signal to immigrants and to the vast immigrant communities that are bringing prosperity to Canada. We, we can't function as a country 
without uh, strengthening and uh, enhancing the number of immigrants that we bring in. It's just that, that's life. That's the way it's going to be. And one of the pleasures I get now when I look back on my own time in office is not the so the bigger ticket items that, that historians look at, but the fact that I moved immigration up to 250,000 a year, the highest in the history of Canada, uh, even throughout the recession, because I believed uh, that you can't build a great country like ours without immigration, and lots of it. So this is the wrong signal to send to the, to the immigrants. Moreover, um, while I didn't study the legislation carefully, I did look at it, and it's clearly unconstitutional. Mm. And I think the La Cour d'Appel du Québec and the Supreme Court of Canada will so, so rule. But it is a place where the notwithstanding clause could be invoked, isn't it? Yes, it is. But you know, uh, there is a weakening in the resolve, you can see it in Quebec, uh, to all of a sudden separate uh, for no, there's no fury, there's no frenzy, there's no na great national debate, there's no impulse, there's There's nothing. no great grievance, really. No, there's no national dream uh, that anyone's articulating. It's, it's kind of pedestrian. How can we put the stick now in with this Charles de Valeur, and maybe we could do this, and maybe we could do... It's all kind of penny-ante uh, stuff as opposed to the great and glorious dreams of a word for, for a separate Quebec, uh, which were articulated by a great Democrat, an eloquent Democrat like René Lévesque, who, by the way, would never have tolerated this Charles de Valeur. No. He was a fundamental Democrat. Yeah. He believed in freedoms of all kinds, and this stuff uh, wouldn't have passed muster with him, which is, I think, one of the, one of the reasons why he had so much appeal. Moving into more specific political matters, would you comment on, I, I mean, you cross swords often with Pierre Trudeau. I hope you're not uncomfortable saying something about your professional evaluation of Justin Trudeau as a party leader. Well, I, I happen to be in Toronto uh, a meeting with the editorial board of the Globe and Mail and the National Post uh, the day <clears throat> that Mr. Trudeau uh, launched his campaign for leadership. And um, they said, well, Mr. Justin Trudeau is going to announce his candidacy today. What do you think? I said, I think the Conservatives will underestimate him at their peril. He's a good-looking guy. He's uh, smart. What's not to like with this picture? Mm -hmm. And uh, so in the present context, Trudeau's big strength is that he's not Stephen Harper. That's what he's doing now. Um, w w will that get him across the street? I don't know. But for the moment, because Mr. Harper has his own persona and his own virtues, and, and they are not inconsiderable in terms of political leadership and accomplishment, but on the personal attributes, he, the other, Justin is younger and uh, he has more panache, and for the moment, that, that has its own appeal. You know, uh, Conrad, if you look at what he's got going here. Uh, Mr. Harper defeated Mr. Martin, mm -hmm. Stefan Dio, and Michael Ignatieff. Yes. Justin Trudeau is no Stefan Dio. Uh, let me ask you about Thomas Mulcair, who is, after all, the leader of the opposition at the moment. Uh, can he hold that position? It seems on its face to be an aberrant status for the NDP, but what, what's your call on that? Well, I, I, I don't know uh, Mr. Mulcair, um, and I thought that he performed uh, well when he introduced that new style into the House of Commons, asking those terse, meaningful questions mm -hmm. uh, about uh, Mr. Harper uh, on those senatorial appointments. Yeah. Um, I thought that was the, uh, the zenith of his parliamentary career. Uh, he, he's going to have to do better and more. He's got Harper who's going to come, come at him uh, all guns blazing, and he's got Trudeau who's going to do the same thing. So Mulcair's got a... Uh, he's in an invidious position, and he's going to have to... You know, they say Trudeau has to get some policy out. He doesn't. The guy that's got to get the policy out fast is Mulcair. 
And it has to be to the right of it where the NDP the, traditionally was. Exactly. Wants. Do you think it was an astute move politically? Not, again, not getting into your own preferences as to what should be done, but politically, was it a good move for Justin Trudeau to propose the legalization of marijuana? Well, I thought it, when it happened, I thought it was dumb uh, because I had read what Margaret had said years ago. Mrs. Trudeau had written that she, she was very much against the, the use of marijuana because it had it led to, in her case, it had led to, to serious uh, drug use uh, that damaged her and damaged other people. And then I found that uh, my daughter-in-law, Jessica, told me that she thought that it might be a generational thing that we were into. And, uh, and my guess is what she meant, is that I was on the wrong generation. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think I was, because it emphasized his youth and it emphasized the big thing that he's not Stephen Harper. That's his big thing. That's what he's going to run on. Mm -hmm. don't, don't, don't worry about me. Just remember, I'm not Stephen Harper. I ran in 1984 on the thing, I'm not Pierre Trudeau. Mm -hmm. And I just got tons of votes because of that. So I, I think it's, it wasn't so dumb anymore. You know, I don't agree with it, mm -hmm. uh, but it was a general, I think Jessica was right. It was a generational thing and uh, it sends a signal to a vast <laughs> reservoir of youth we have that says, look, I'm not Stephen Harper. I, I, I can understand this, all of this stuff, and if you do it, I'm not going to put you in the slammer. Well, Brian, uh, for 48 years, every yeah. conversation we've ever yeah. had has been a pleasure for me, <laughs> and thank you for joining us. Well, this one has been also. Thank you for having me, Conrad, and good wish, good luck with the... Well, I'm following your advice well, and starting a new career. Absolutely. <laughs> That was very candid. Do you think he, he's, he's a marketing company now for Justin? Is that he just gave him a free slogan? No, but the <laughs> relations between him and Harper are not that intimate, you know. Ah, between Prime Minister Harper. I, I, I and think it's fair Arunia. to say that Brand was not in transports of delight uh, over every moment of the elephant inquiry. Now, did you find it odd, interesting that the first attribute of Justin's that he praised said he's a good-looking guy? And, and how much of this do you think is that dynastic thing? It's a first that you'd have the son of a prime minister as a party leader. You've often had sons of cabinet ministers become cabinet ministers or sons of prime ministers occasionally in parliament, like uh, uh, Saint Laurent, for example. Uh, but um, but this, is, this has never happened before, and so it, it, is, it is unusual. And of American course, it wasn't style. that long ago. Most people remember Trudeau, and even those who don't, he's a famous name. You can see more of Conrad's interview online, so go to www.thezoomertv.com. Stay with us. The U.S. is not now a society of just laws and Canada should not have an extradition treaty with it. The United States, which calls itself the land of the free, has six to 12 times as many incarcerated people per capita as other advanced democratic countries such as Canada, Australia, Britain, France, Germany, and Japan. With 5% of the world's population, the U.S. has 25% of its incarcerated people and 50% of the world's professionally qualified lawyers. 97% of prosecutions are pleaded guilty without trial because more than 80% of the few that go to trial are guilty findings that then impose sentences four times heavier than on those who helpfully decline to exercise their constitutional right to a trial. In Canada, only about 65% of prosecutions are successful, and almost half of those don't carry a custodial sentence. The American Bill of Rights promises due process, a grand jury that acts as an assurance against capricious prosecution, no seizure of property without just compensation, access to counsel of choice, an impartial jury, prompt justice, and reasonable bail. All these founding principles of justice have been shredded. Today, the plea bargain is usually extorted by the prosecutor's threat to charge everyone remotely connected to the target as complicit in a conspiracy, 
unless they roll over and testify against the target with an immunity for perjury. The defendant's assets are often frozen as ill-gotten gains in ex parte proceedings, forcing the targeted individuals into the hands of the public defenders who are stooges of the prosecutors. The prosecution speaks last to the jury, which doesn't see the trial transcript and just relies on its recollections, no matter how complicated and lengthy the case. Most judges are ex-prosecutors, and the legal profession is a cartel that legislates endless, herniating masses of new laws and regulations and accounts for a scandalous 10% of GDP, $1.6 trillion annually. Prosecutors enjoy an absolute immunity even when they are caught willfully withholding exculpatory evidence. And there are a staggering 48 million Americans with a criminal record, none of whom are allowed in this country. The U.S. is not now a society of just laws, and Canada should not have an extradition treaty with it. I have a hunch you're going to want to tell us what you think. And we want to hear from you. It's a show for you, so we welcome your input. Find us on the ZoomerTV.com and Vision TV's Facebook page. Tweet, if you like, at the Zoomer TV. Thank you all for being with us. You guys were fantastic. Thank you so much. Who have we got in the chair next week? Bob Ray. Bob Who's Ray. Who's now uh, our man with the Native people. And we couldn't have a better person. Okay, uh, and agree. it's a very interesting uh, series of comments he makes. You never win marks with, with friends when you tell them something that they, they really don't necessarily want to. It's like telling a guy you don't like his girlfriend. Uh, Zoomers have very low rates of drinking and driving. They almost always wear their seatbelt. We are, in fact, co-venture owners of a cow. We are. Have you laid eyes on our cow? I've laid eyes on a picture of it. <laughs> it looks like a cow. <laughs> 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 Good night, everyone. Thanks for being with us. I'm going to see you next week. We're zooming out. Thank you.